The Art Gallery of Ontario is situated on Michisagig, Mississauga, Anishinaabe territory and is governed by the Toronto Purchase Treaty 13 between the British government and the Mississaugas from 1805. The Dish with One Spoon is a wampum treaty agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe Confederacy to peacefully share the resources around these great lakes that feed and sustain us all. Since 2017, the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department at the Art Gallery of Ontario has been modeled on a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with co-leads of the department, with Wanda Nanabush as the curator of Indigenous art and with me as the curator of Canadian art. We work together, we work separately, and we always work in relation to one another. Our department holds at its core the values of peace and treaty, uh, peace and friendship treaties. And these are values of mutual respect, reciprocity, honesty, integrity, the sharing of resources, of power, of responsibilities, most importantly, the responsibility to care for one another. And these are guiding principles for me, and I try to uphold them and seek to live up to them in everything that I do. By removing hierarchy and working collaboratively, we seek to model structural change that is so urgent and very much needed. And in the context of this gathering, where the first word is Canadian, I wanted to share with you that I've been thinking for the past three and a half years a lot about how I rearticulate my responsibilities, especially in this moment where there is no longer a singular authority, but rather in relation to one another, in relation to each other. What does it mean to present, conceive, collect, and program the work of Canadian art and artists in an institution that holds Canadian identity at its core, in an institution that historically it has gone out of its way to not collect, exhibit, or program or research the word, the work of Indigenous art and artists. We stand in solidarity with Indigenous people across the world, across the continent, in affirming and asserting their sovereignty, also in affirming their inherent rights to self-government. As we are meeting in this virtual space, what I would like to do is invite you all to share the territory, whether treated or unseated, that you are joining us today. And I truly hope in the chat function, you will join me in this act of solidarity. And with this, on behalf of the Art Gallery of Ontario, I would like to welcome you to the Canadian Women Artists History Initiative, or uh, lovingly referred to as Kwahi. This time it is a partnership between Concordia University, the Art Gallery of Ontario, Ryerson University, and the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. My dream had been on this day to welcome you to the Art Gallery of Ontario, but here we are instead. It gives me great pride and honor to introduce you to Dr. Christina Huneau, a formidable force in our field and the co-founder of Kwahi at Concordia University. Christina, I pass the Zoom Zoom on to you. Thank you so much, Georgiana. Good morning, everybody. We are so excited that you've decided to join us at this fourth conference of the Canadian Women Artists History Initiative. And we're thankful to each of our partners for bringing their energies and resources together with ours. And I particularly want to extend thanks to our principal sponsor, the Stephen and Gay Ale Jaroslawski Institute for Studies in Canadian Art at Concordia University. And I want to recognize also you, the speakers who have worked so hard to prepare for today and the audience members who make that effort worthwhile. Thank you for being with us. So we're together then, this time in the ether, to discuss the conjunction of women, art, history, and ideas. And with the McMichael's uninvited exhibition in mind, we particularly are interested in that cluster of ideas that fly together under the banner of the modern. Now, over the, the years, the decades now, feminist scholars have differed in their understandings of the impact of modernism and modernity for women artists. At its peak, high modernism wrote women out almost entirely from its heroic 
narrative of progress. And we've also recognized, too, the masculinist thrust in key modernist themes, whether that's the female nudes of the continent or the bushwhacking of the colonies. At the same time, we can't underestimate the liberatory potential of the modern, the room that it opened up to experiment, to break out, to try things differently. No accident then that when the men of the Group of Seven waged their war against the Royal Canadian Academy, women artists were their most significant allies in pressing for change. But women had to be careful how they broke ranks. At first, just having a career was risk enough and only those who were independently wealthy could really risk being ahead of the curve of public aesthetic opinion. All this we've known for some while, but what uninvited and the Canadian context give us is a new understanding of just how partial that picture is. Walking through the galleries at the McMichael last night, which I was privileged to do, I couldn't help be, but be struck by the visual power of the Nakoda and the Nitsitapi moccasins, the quill work baskets by Mi'kmaq basket maker Bridget Ann Sack, the stunning dress by Mrs. Walkingson. Visually, their designs scream modern to the Euro-Canadian eye, but they are, of course, the products of legacy and of tradition. And while modernity brought increased freedom for settler women, it brought destitution to Indigenous women and incarceration to their children. So the art of Indigenous women then stands the modernist art historical complex on its head. It's tradition that is bold. It's repression that, that accompanies social change. Is it even possible to tell a story of women and the modern in Canada that brings these different realities together? And that's what I'm wondering and thinking about as I head into this conference. And I can't wait to hear over the course of our conference the kind of concerns and preoccupations that you have. With Zoom fatigue as our constant companion, we have tried to keep our sessions short and our papers even shorter to leave room for discussion. Sessions are only an hour long and they follow back to back in the same Zoom rooms. So if you want to keep the discussion in your panel going, or if you want to chat with a friend or a colleague during the conference, we encourage you to come over to the Wonder Room. And don't be nervous if you haven't tried it before. I think you'll really be pleasantly surprised by how easily and spontaneously it lets us talk together in small groups who are spontaneous, spontaneously joined. The Wonder Room is open for the length of the conference. So if you ever have a question, somebody will be there for you to ask. It's like our virtual registration desk and coffee area and uh, cocktail lounge all in one. You can get the link and indeed all the links to the different conference sessions in the conference at a glance section of the program. And with that, it is my real pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Irena Gamel. Dr. Gamel is professor of English at Ryerson University. She's Canada Research Chair in Modern Literature and Culture and the Director of the Modern Literature and Research Culture Center. She's the author and editor of no fewer than 14 books, including the internationally acclaimed Baroness Elsa, Gender Data and Everyday Modernity, published by MIT Press, and also in a quite different vein, looking for Anne of Green Gables, St. Martin's Press, <laughs> as well as over 50 peer-reviewed articles and chapters She's well known for her scholarship on gender and modernism, which is why we were so pleased to meet her and invite her to our conference today. Her research has helped uncover the earliest roots of modern and feminist performance art. And of course, it has also contributed to the consolidation of Lucy Maud Montgomery studies as an academic field, not just a popular field, and claimed women's confessional discourses as a subdiscipline of autobiographical studies. We welcome you, Irena. We're so anxious to hear what you have to tell us today. Thank you so, so much for these wonderful and also extremely thoughtful introduction. 
it's just a, a heartwarming to hear about the commitment of uh, uh, AGO to what Georgiana calls rearticulating authority. I think that's so important. And I think we all recognize that art institutions, artists, female artists, and also educators have such an important role to play within this realm. So thank you so much. Uh, also, Christina and uh, Janice and uh, Sarah uh, and Georgiana for all of the hard work that you've been doing also on behalf of Canadian women artists and the struggle that they have faced throughout the decades. Certainly the work that you've done is inspirational. So, and I think it's wonderful that we also have a lot of students here today who can continue this particular tradition. So I think we want to see all of this also as a bit of a uh, call to arms to be involved in these particular uh, issues and to, to continue on it. Uh, it's a privilege also to work with the distinguished partners and to have our MLC team, notably Dr. Jason Wong and Olivia Trono involved in this conference. And I also want to thank all of the conference participants and all of you who help in the recovery of Canadian women artists. The theme of the conference, modernism inside and out, invokes the critical paradigm of inclusion, and exclusion, asking us to put the spotlight on the systemic nature of biases, ethnic, gender, socioeconomic, regional, that have structured the art system and have relegated many modern women artists into the sidelines of Canadian history. Part of the problem is the archival erasure that limits art historical work on Canadian women artists, as Christina Uno has documented in her book, I'm Not Myself at All, Women, Art and Subjectivity in Canada. Her approach in emphasizing the subjectivity of women artists is one I share, as the considerations of the self reveal the tensions, uncertainties and fractures that are so characteristic of interior life and which also mirror and help shape the exterior social life. In my 20 plus years of experience in working on modernist women artists and writers in both Canada and the United States, I have argued that a central reason why women artists have been dismissed, neglected, ridiculed, or sidelined as historical footnotes is the fact that their aesthetics and their thematics are often different from the institutions of high modernism or the mainstream male modernism, including the controlling discourses of critics such as Le Corbusier and Clement Greenberg. But within these models, women artists have also inserted their own subjectivity by precisely subverting and resisting the dominant modes that have labored to contain them. For example, maverick modernist painter Kathleen Munn has, quote, shaped her own vision rather than follow the direction promoted by the national art movement represented by the group of seven, as curator Georgiana Ulyarik has contended in her book on the artist. And the same can be said about the women of Beaver Hall, the Canadian modernist painters who were active during the early 1920s, as Evelyn Walters has shown, they were, quote, more interested in technique and with shifting the emphasis from dominant landscape imagery to more personal aspects of expression. Here, I see a confluence of ideas that have shaped my own research regarding Canadian artists Mary Ryder Hamilton. Just as the women artists discussed by Uno, Ulyarik, Walters, and others, Hamilton's work centers on the affective, the personal, and the psychological. And she does so with a truly unique and extraordinary modernist trajectory, traveling through the European battlefields and witnessing the horrors of a continent-turned-war zone. In the following, 
I want to share a sense of recovering Hamilton through her home front and battlefield experiences and paintings. And I end by sharing my method of counteracting archival erasure with my book, I Can Only Paint, and also provide a brief reading from this book. To begin, Mary Rita Hamilton was an Ontario born painter trained in Berlin and Paris, who settled on the West Coast in Victoria just before the war. A painter of renown who painted evocative landscapes of Canada's West, Hamilton was then better known than the now well-known Emily Carr. When the First World War broke out, Hamilton became deeply engaged in patriotic activity, painting settings for fundraisers and donating her work to be auctioned for the Belgian Relief Fund. Keen to see the war for herself, she applied to be a war artist, but was rejected not once, but several times by the men in charge of the Young National Gallery, and notably by its director, Eric Brown, and also by uh, Sir uh, Edmund Walker, the latter responsible for helping make selections of artists that would travel overseas and paint uh, for the Canadian War Memorial Fund. And this Canadian War Memorial Fund was really funded by Lord Beaverbrook, who was then in London. One reason for this rejection of Hamilton was her gender. Battlefields being considered the quintessential male territory and Hamilton's claiming of masculine space for herself and her art was considered a brazen transgression. There was a clear question among these men about Hamilton's temperament. If women were meant to paint the war, they were meant to paint the home front, and that is the civilian activities in Canada. Providing even deeper ideological texture, Edmund Walker believed that a war should not be recorded in art as it occurred, but should be painted years later in sublimated form so as to pay tribute to the dead and acknowledge victory instead of depicting the ugliness of the battlefield. This vision was later materialized in Walter Allward's Vimy Ridge Memorial, which would soar into Canadian consciousness during the 1930s. However, despite these rejections, Hamilton was determined to see the war with her own eyes and to respond to it, and she persisted in her lobbying. Immediately after the armistice, she was commissioned by the War Amputations Club of British Columbia to paint the Canadian war sites in Europe. And so she traveled overseas at the age of 51, which is quite remarkable given what was ahead of her. But what was even more interesting was the fact that she, on her passport, she claimed to be 36, which of course was an age much more in line with uh, war work at the time. From 1919 to 1921, she immersed herself in the battlefields and ruined villages of northern France and Belgium, creating a remarkable collection of 320 war paintings and sketches in oil, drawings in pencil and charcoal, as well as a handful of etchings. This experience would transform her and her style. Here in the slides, we see her empathic, but also determined with a charismatic vision for what she wanted to achieve as she worked outside of the official government war art program. When Hamilton arrived on the battlefields in April of 1919, she faced danger and desolation. The land was a maze of trenches, craters, dugouts, traps, and barbed wire. The earth was scarred and poisoned with lingering gas shells. The soil was filled with bodies, fragmented human and animal remains. In total, Canada had lost 67,000 soldiers, 
having participated in the war for four long years. In addition, there were a staggering four million allied soldiers still missing in action. Here in the slide, we see the body bags collected by the war graves workers who were charged with the grisly task of burying the dead in 1919, the exact same time that Hamilton was here to paint. It was like living in a graveyard, said Hamilton, who painted the many cemeteries that dotted the road. Since the dead were not repatriated, she knew that many families at home would never be able to make the trip to see their loved ones' graves. And so she challenged herself to travel to the most remote areas, including the sum, as seen here in the slide with the top two uh, paintings. In this, she developed a semiotics of mourning and remembering with many cruciform trees yeah, that uh, we see in her work. And while the cruciform trees were a popular staple in war art, she developed her own unique style and perspective. At the core of these works is Hamilton's empathy for the soldiers who had suffered and the land and the towns that had been destroyed. Here we see her oil painting, Battlefields from Vimy Ridge, Lens Arras Road, which was a famous road, yeah, traveled especially by Canadian soldiers uh, during these fights. And we also see the Mont saint eloi in the background, its towers standing in timeless and calming blue. But there is also a tension a mass cemetery stands at midfield, while in the foreground, vivid colors and muddy trenches speak of the vibrancy of the lives lost. Today, this effort to render mass death and to mourn the dead is more important than ever as we confront our own sense of a surreal unreality and statistical obscuring of the ever-growing death statistics of COVID-19. In a ruined interior, Arras, Hamilton takes the viewer inside, articulating a woman's perspective and focusing on the domestic spaces uh, and communicating anguish from within. Refusing to paint from a safe vantage, she puts her body on the line putting herself deep inside the collapsing structure, the danger and difficulties becoming a central part of her creativity, fueling her work. Through her own immersive and gendered style, Hamilton creates deeply ethical responses to the effects of the First World War. In this, Hamilton's work and journey differed from that of the official war artists. Official war artists typically made brief sketching trips to the battlefields and then prepared highly polished and monumental paintings in their London and Paris studios. The most famous of these Canadian War Memorial Commission paintings is Richard Jack's The Second Battle of Eve, shown here in the slide. And it was really the 1915 uh, Second Battle of Eve was what really prompted Beaverbrook to start this, um, uh, the, the Canadian war art program, uh, because there were no real photographs of this battle. And so the sense was we need to paint these things, we need to commemorate what happened and to pay tribute to Canadian soldiers. It depicts a dramatic reconstruction of the combat by using unrealistic 19th century war art conventions. An even group of seven artists like Frederick Varley and Arthur Lisma, who are much more realistic in their representation and critical as well, uh, used photographs in many of their representations, which they merged with their own experience to create amalgamated scenes. Hamilton, by contrast, pioneered her own visceral style that emanated from her own immersive experience of the fields. Quote, when I arrived at Vimy, it was snowing, she later wrote in a letter. I'm glad I saw it under hard conditions. Exposing herself to the elements was her way 
of getting close to the soldiers. After all, it was snowing on April 9th, 1917, the first day Canadians fought at Vimy. On her expedition, Hamilton overnighted in war-torn Nissen huts, or military shelters as seen here in the slide. By 1920, her war studio included a bombed out attic in Arras. So very close to the Vimy Ridge, actually, just a few kilometers away. Uh, she often ground her colors on the battlefield. And during this time, she also lived in extreme poverty, often starving herself to pay for painting supplies. And I just want to draw very briefly, want to draw your attention to these huts, which I just find absolutely fascinating. Here at the bottom center, this photograph of Hamilton in her, in her canvas hut, uh, it, 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 it tells us so much. Yeah, she's fallen asleep here. She's still holding what looks like a work of art in her hand. And in front of her, in this primitive hut, she has lined up many of the paintings that she's painted. And what's fascinating about this, when you use your computer, you go very, very close, you can actually identify these various paintings uh, that, uh, and, and, and kind of allowing us to also see where she's been by the time she paints this particular work. Her work is understated and typically painted without studio finish and extremely intimate, forcing viewers to move close up to see the details. As she explained, quote, some of my pictures are quite small owing to the difficulty of carrying large canvases through the mud and water and the filth of the region of, at that time, unreclaimed shell holes. She also describes her impetus as follows. I came out because I felt I must come. And if I did not come at once, it would be too late because the battlefields would be obliterated. It seemed to me that something was in danger of being lost. I did not come in any official mission. I had to come. Using her bodily senses as her primary tool, she painted scenes that were typically not in the limelight, such as the cemeteries, the isolated graves, the cleanup of the war, the reconstruction, the women and the children, the shattering of families and the mourning. Here in the slide, we see Hamilton's evocative oil with the elaborate title, Gun Emplacements, Farbus Wood, Vimy Ridge, a site located on the Eastern side of the Vimy Ridge, which was occupied and heavily fortified by German gunners in 1917. In the foreground, the shell rips into the earth and that's where she places herself to paint. It's a movement so aggressive that it pushes the land and destabilizes the white cross behind, pulling it into the realm of forgetting. From August 1919 into 1920, when she had her camp at Écurie, the southwestern flank of the Vimy Ridge, she lived in walking distance to the so-called labyrinths or underground military villages where engineers, so-called zappers, had blown up thousands of people with mining explosions, creating mass graves. Here, she grapples with representing mass death in a work entitled Memorial for the Second Canadian Division in a Mine Crater near Neuville Saint Vast. Normally, we expect graves to be covered, but here it is open, an alarmingly deep hole whereby the cutaway gives Rios a startling open perspective, confronting us with the decimation of an entire regiment. The purple walls of this giant cavity speak of the absence of the large group that solicits the viewer's mourning. Also from her vantage point at Écurie, she painted remains of the church at Neuville Saint Vast. Here, she includes mourners at the top of the street and we look at others affected by death. In this cross-generational family of mourners, 
the physical gap in the family line suggests an absent son who would complete this line. The mourning mother in the center faces the ruin while her husband to the left turns away from the scene, lost amid the mountain of rubble behind him, perhaps too old to begin the process of reconstructing. In filling the shell holes in no man's land, she depicted scenes of restoration and repair, the later work shifting her emphasis, focusing also on the teamwork required to repair the damage. Thus her alternate history tracked the difficult labor of turning contaminated lands and ruined towns into places of new community action. Specifically, her dual focus on the parallel themes of destruction and reconstruction, upheaval and recovery was a key strategy. This slide shows her depiction of marketplace among the ruins of Ypres, the much besieged town in Flanders. Whereas in 1919, only a couple of stands rose on the simple umbrellas. By 1920, tightly stacked awnings filled the left side of the painting with a cloth hall on the right. Customers crowd in where the yellow, orange, and green merchandise flashes on the tables. Life emerging again against the ruins of the destroyed town. In the center, she recorded the figures in black, revealing the grieving family members at a distance amidst signs of hope and new life. They are the unglamorous images that cannot easily function as images of national glory. And so Hamilton herself was forgotten after the war, her work marginalized for many decades. And yet she and her work should be remembered, especially because of the alternate history and because she herself paid a heavy price in securing this work that yields so much insight today, not only about the upheaval, but also about the recovery. Perhaps her most apocalyptic work, Clearing the Battlefields in Flanders, painted in 1921, depicts a darkening scene and oil on cardboard. This is a battlefield inferno, three years after the war's end. Here she emphasizes the peril facing war workers who are immersed in the site and still breathe the toxic fumes that would cause them long-term health problems. She opens the viewer's eyes to the dangers surrounding those who braved the post-war battlefields, not least of whom was Hamilton herself. My book explores precisely the transformation that Mary Writer Hamilton underwent during her remarkable and unprecedented exped expedition from 1919 to 1921. Her focus on including the destroyed landscape the dead, the mourning families, the war workers, instead of the famous commanders, made it more difficult for her to become a national icon. And so except for feminists, the war amps and a few fans, she was overlooked and largely written out of official history and art history. In 1926, when Hamilton was exhausted and traumatized from the battlefield expedition, her friend Aurelia Rogers, the spouse of a long time federal politician was keen to help and did so by delivering in person a sampling of seven battlefield paintings to the National Gallery to see if they might accept the collection. The director of the National Gallery, Eric Brown, offered to purchase a handful of her paintings, but his perfunctory letter and his total lack of interest in even seeing the collection and mentioning anything about her expedition put her at a distance and she actually refused to sell her work, donating the collection to the Archives of Canada instead. Today, while 227 of her works are available through Library and Archives Canada, only a, a part, about a third of which 
uh, can be seen online. And another 100 paintings, those that were not part of the donation, are widely dispersed. This is because she refused to sell her war work, giving them instead as gifts to friends and families. And um, I think it's also very telling today that even to this point, she is not included in the National Gallery of Canada. So in the remaining minutes, I want to return to the archival erasure that I mentioned at the outset, and that requires special methods for recovering women artists a century later. I've written several biographies on women writers and artists, but Hamilton's case is unique and that the research method included traveling to the battlefields of the First World War. I used the paintings themselves as a guide to travel in Hamilton's footsteps to the different sites, which brought me close to her and to those landscapes. In this journey, I carried my iPhone and notebook and traveled in a car, which constantly reminded me that she had to travel on foot, trekking through dangerous and muddy trenches while carrying a heavy load, her canvas, painting supplies, food, and water. Because there were few records in the official archives, my research had to rely on countless family archives, which involved an intricate journey across Canada. In Vancouver, Ronald T. Ryder, the executor of the Hamilton estate, opened his private home, taking me all the way up to their personal bedroom, where he pulled several paintings from underneath the bed. In the upper right, we see gallery owner Uno Langman in Vancouver, who welcomed me by saying that any friend of Mary Retta Hamilton's was his friend too. So that's good, she has some fans. It took years to accumulate the research, including tracking the many paintings and assembling the fragments into a story. One enormous challenge was the lack of diaries and letters retelling the story. As Hamilton claimed in an interview, I cannot talk, I can only paint which would become the title of my book. However, the first time I felt I heard her voice was the day when I received a shoebox with 26 of Hamilton's battlefield letters and they uh, were donated uh, to my MLC Research Center in 2015. These are the rare documents now preserved at our archive and many transcribed and reproduced in I Can Only Paint. Telling her story was ultimately a forensic piecing together of the fragments, each fragment bringing me closer to the subject. So what ultimately can readers learn from this book and from Mary Writer Hamilton? You will learn about an artist who broke gender boundaries on the battlefield and became, albeit unofficially, Canada's first female battlefield painter. You will meet an artist with a remarkable determination and empathy for human vulnerability. And you will also learn about a patriotic woman who underwent a transformation in visiting the battlefields and develop an extraordinary vision for how to represent the war's effects in art. I want to end by reading a very brief passage from the introduction. The introduction is entitled, Here's Where the World Ends. This short passage is inspired by the painting um, of an observation post that you see here in the slide. This observation post is positioned on the Loretta Ridge uh, in Northern France, overlooking the Vimy Ridge. So Vimy Ridge in the background. So here we go. She blankets the Vimy Ridge in shades of ocean blue. On a hot day, an eerie silence hangs over deserted ground. The battlefields depleted from the grind of bloody clashes. Under the haze, the rippled metal of an observation post flickers red brown in the sun. A lone boot rests on ochre clay. 
The landscape, once beautiful, lies ravaged by four years of violence known collectively as the Great War. Standing tall and intent in her skirt, blouse, and hat, <clears throat> she works under the stifling sun in this violated terrain. An observer spotting this stranger through binoculars might see her as an apparition or at the very least a perplexing presence to be so matter-of-factly engaged with brush and oils and canvas in such a setting as though there was no other place she would rather be than in Northern France in the aftermath of war. Since the battlefields were considered a male domain, she had to overcome many hurdles to get there. Yet that ordeal is nothing compared with the journey through the horror that lies at her feet once she arrived. Today, Mary Reiter Hamilton's oil painting of that day, entitled Entrance to Canadian Observation Post on Loretta Ridge, testifies to that which she witnessed a hundred years ago before the battlefields were restored by human hand and nature. With a special security pass, I was able to contemplate this work and hundreds of others in the underground vault of the Library and Archive Canada Preservation Center in Gatineau, Quebec, which houses the largest collection of Hamilton's work, 227 paintings and drawings amid a total of 425,000 works of Canadian art. Having descended into the depth of the bunker in a noiseless elevator, the archivist and I step out into a silent room, hearing nothing but the clicking of our shoes on the concrete floor. The archivist draws out the sliding walls. The soft rattling of wooden frames chatters against the stillness of the vault. The walls carry approximately 15 paintings on each side, bearing the weight of expressive moments snatched by Mary Wright Hamilton. Her signature, often overwriting scenes of mud and water and barbed wire, proclaims her the protagonist of this journey through the land of the living and the dead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irena. It's great to hear your talk. I would uh, invite everybody to find the reaction button down at the bottom of the Zoom panel. And if you want to join me in giving Irena a, uh, a round of virtual applause. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> So we're going to take a uh, we have about uh, 15, almost 15 minutes for questions. Uh, and you can ask your questions in two ways. You can raise your hand following Martha Langford, who I already see on the top left of my screen. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Zoom, if there are any of us left in the world, uh, you can find the raise hand button in the little reactions button at the bottom towards the right of your screen. Uh, or you can also put a question in the chat uh, which you can also find at the bottom of your screen, and we will uh, uh, have our moderator uh, read your chat out loud. So uh, if uh, we could unmute Martha Langford's microphone, please, Olivia. I'm asking you to unmute Martha. Can you please confirm on your end? Great. Okay. Thank you so much for your paper and your and your book and your work and your passion. Uh, much, much appreciated. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, a question about the suppression of her work, which is effectively one of the themes of your of your study and how much uh, you felt that generally that the government's um, propaganda efforts to still the anxiety of the of the widows and mothers who wanted their um their loved ones brought home um by waiting effectively to show them the beautiful uh cemetery that you photographed yourself so all of that uh important work that was that was being done in order to quell people's uh feelings i just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that Thank you so much for that question, Martha. And of course, it goes to a heart to a very important issue, and that is a war 
a war is being fought typically with the heavy uh, artillery that includes the rhetorical artillery. And art plays a very important part in it, as do photographs and so on. So all of this is very carefully uh, presented. And uh, the point that you made about the government's um, reluctance to have too much information go out there is, of course, very, very important. Uh, a very important part that I find so telling is the fact that at the time women were encouraged when their loved ones died, when a son died, when a husband died, not even to wear black. It was a part of a woman's patriotic duty to go back, to be as if nothing had happened, so as not to draw attention publicly to all of the losses that had been suffered. And so where Mary Rita Hamilton comes in, of course, it's with that insistence. We cannot simply move on. We cannot simply say this war has been fought, it's been won, and now we move on to some other elements. She insisted on that remembering. And I think in a way that also conflicted with her own patriotism, because when she first wanted to head out there, her language was very much that discourse. Oh, we are going to showcase, you know, the, 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 the glorious um, uh, deeds that our soldiers did on the battlefield and they've already shown their metal and now we can show ours through art. So that was very much the position from which she started when she first applied uh, and sent her letter uh, to Walker. The other interesting thing is that the sort of results of various uh, battles. When you look at the Battle of uh, the Somme, for example, there was a lot of soul searching after that because it was such a disastrous battle from any point of view. But the Battle of Vimy Ridge was different in the sense that that was something where Canada triumphed, where other nations had had flopped. And so in that sense, there was a signing up. So many soldiers signed up after Vimy Ridge. And what's fascinating is that one of the letters she sent to Sir Edmund Walker was is dated just a few days after Vimy Ridge. So it also gave her that additional impetus to try again and to see that she could uh, sway him uh, to send her to the battlefields. But of course, uh, Sir Edmund Walker would have nothing of it. You know, he uh, was not interested in sending Mary Wright to Hamilton uh, to the battlefields. Um, Irena, Risa Greenberg is in the audience and she's wondering if there are any works by Hamilton in the collection of the Canadian War Museum now. There is only one work and I still don't know exactly how it arrived there. It is a work that is um, a, a, a sort of variant of another one. It's a, a dugout at Blanchy and it's absolutely fascinating that that is held in the archives at, of the War Museum, but that's the only one. And I've always been wondering, speculating, might this have been one of the works that had been taken by Aurelia Rogers to the National Gallery at the time. And um, when Mary Wright Hamilton decided that she did not want to sell even a handful of paintings to the National Gallery after receiving that letter from Eric Brown, she stipulated, she says, please send these letters to the Dominion archives. She wanted them transferred. She wanted all these, these, these paintings to be together, but for some reason, possibly one stayed. So it, it would be interesting to find out why exactly that particular one, but there is one is there. Thanks. I'll put these two questions together, one about during the war and one about after. Um, during the war, were there any other women artists that she might have encountered? Did she have any kind of collaboration uh, or participation with them? And then also what happened after the war and particularly her, war, her work after the war? What, what was her art like? Do you have any thoughts about it? Thank you so much. <clears throat> 
What's fascinating is that during the time that she spent in Europe, overseas, on the battlefields, they were obviously post-war times. There are only a few home front works that she painted. I've always been surprised by the fact that she didn't paint a lot of home front works. Uh, she was really focused on the battlefield. And on the battlefields themselves, um, she would certainly have met um, uh, Olivia um, um, uh, Moody, who was one of the um, uh, one of the battlefield artists uh, from Britain. So Britain at the time uh, had sent several people over after the war, and they were painting. And the other person that um, Mary Writer Hamilton would most definitely have met is uh, David Milne. David Milne was uh, arrived in Combe la Bay, which was uh, Mary Rita Hamilton's first camp where she was embedded with the military. And he arrived there two weeks after she was there. And in one photographs, Mary Rita Hamilton sits in a car in a big Cadillac, which looks as if she's this lady painter that's just traveling around in a big car, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, the car was David, uh, was, was Milne's car. And so in that sense, it's quite interesting because she had been assigned the car, but lost the car in an accident a week later. So she always had traveling problems and the, 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 the conditions of the fields were so bad that uh, you needed a good car in order to just get into certain uh, realms. And uh, often the car would stop when the mud started and then the painter started to walk. So uh, those two would certainly have been women that she encountered. She also talks about another British woman painter whom she does not uh, name. And she said, that that British woman painter arrived and said to her that um, she didn't know how to paint the battlefields. But then when she saw Mary Rita Hamilton do it, she also found her own style. So I thought that that was interesting. And that could have been Moody Cook, actually, because they were certainly painting some of the scenes in Flanders at the, at the very same time. There's a question about after the war and what her work, what direction her work took after that. Good point. So after the war, the sad story is that Mary Rita Hamilton was really profoundly affected by her war experience. She came home traumatized. She had several massive breakdowns and uh, she was trying again and again. She was a very active, vibrant woman who even on the battlefields created her own exhibitions and so on. And then by uh, 1920, uh, to 1920, late 1921, then 1922, the effects of the battlefields made themselves felt. And it's, it was clear to me in looking at the documents that she was suffering from, from post-trauma and that she never fully recuperated from that. The good thing was she was able to, uh, she lived in abject poverty. I mean, the things were disastrous. But at the same time, she received uh, an award in Paris. And so that was important. Her work was showcased there. And um, in that sense, she had some success, but most of the success that she had was in France and was not in Canada itself. So she was able to bring her paintings home only in late 1925. And by that time, it, it, it was a totally different period. People didn't want to talk as much about the war anymore. And uh, so there were a few exhibitions, but nothing major, nothing that would have kind of brought her back. And in her later life, she still painted, but it was nothing that had the power as what she had painted previously. It was clear that she had been very deeply affected by the war. Uh, Steph was uh, listening very closely and noticed that uh, you mentioned she sometimes ground her paints actually on the battlefield. 
do you know anything? Have you found any documentation about the materials that she used and where did she source them? Did she just bring them all with her or Good something point. else? Good point. So she was in close contact with some of the suppliers in Paris, the um, uh, um, uh, where she purchased her canvases. And uh, the other place where she would have purchased canvases were uh, it was was Arras, but everything. When you look at the canvases, the commercial ones, they are all very very different. So they look pieced together. There is not a consistency there. And the other thing that's fascinating, she used whatever was available. For example, some of her paintings that she made at the Somme were painted on panels made from hospital screens, which I think is just so appropriate uh, because it was recycled material. It was something that was used during the war itself that she was able to recycle then in her own work. So she used anything. She used cardboard. She used paper. She used um, uh, 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 boards that she would, uh, wooden boards that she would paint on. And uh, you can see how she replicates almost the spontaneity of the war itself and had to make do this because painting materials were also incredibly expensive in the immediate post-war time. I think that's something that we see also with Dadaists, for example, who often thematized that uh, 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 a particular problem, the expenses of war material, of, of materials uh, after the war. So your observations on uh, materiality have, uh, have prompted an intervention from Diana Nemiroff. Diana is wondering, wasn't plein air, made, plein air painting made possible by the availability of commercially prepared oil paints? So what's this, this connection between uh, commercial paint and plein air as it was experienced by Mary Ryder Hamilton? Uh, I think she used the, the, the grinding of the colors because number one, it was a less expensive method for her. And it would also have given her a bit more control in terms of what she was doing. And it's a reference. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of great detail about it, but it's a reference that is found in a 1926 article. And it's that's the only reference to her grinding of these colors. But it is an article that is a very reliable newspaper article and that is based on a direct interview with her. So in that sense, it's, it's an important point to make. But unfortunately, she, she does not give us a lot of information on that. There's a question about reputation. Uh, Randall Robertson says you referenced Hamilton as being better known pre-war than Emily Carr. Did Hamilton and Carr have any awareness of each other? I'm sure they did because they are both linked to Victoria and uh, the, 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 they were exhibiting in some of the same places in Victoria. So in that sense, I'm sure they would have known of each other. <clears throat> there were also some fascinating similarities between these two women. Yeah, they were both sort of loners later in life, surrounded by their dogs and so on, and uh, were also quite outspoken and uh, and and could be uh, 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 um, uh, at times not so not so polite. Yeah, when somebody came along, uh, and we certainly uh, didn't suffer fools gladly. So in that sense, lots of interesting connections between the two women. Um, I've not been able to fully put them together, but I would assume that they knew each other. The other thing that I find interesting is that some of Mary Ryder Hamilton's uh, sort of war paintings around 1915, uh, <clears throat> and they were paintings of Victoria itself, use this technique of these swirling trees a little bit that are so uh, characteristic also of of, uh, um, of car. So in, in that sense, an interesting connection there as well. Thanks, Serena. So um, I see there are still other questions. 
but we're at 11 o'clock. We need to prepare this room for the next sessions that will be starting again in 15 minutes. It's time for a coffee break. Um, so uh, uh, Olivia has put the URL for the Wonder Room in the chat. I would encourage you, if you have more questions for Arena, I know she'll be going over to the Wonder Room and happy to talk further with people. Um, and it, even if you don't have questions, I know a number of people put wonderful congratulations and uh, remarks of appreciation in the chat so you can express them to her in uh, person. Uh, so our next uh, sessions begin at 11.15. We have three different options. Uh, in this room where you are now, this Zoom room, it will be the first of our panel discussions by participants in the Uninvited Exhibition Catalog, uh, which will be chaired by Sarah Milroy. So it's about women painting women, modern nudes and bodies at 11.15. Then in the Ryerson link, there are three academic papers about inside and outside modern architecture. And then if you have uh, advanced registered for a special session in the AGO drawing centers remotely about Edith, Edith Watson, then you will have received the link for that registration uh, in your email. Unfortunately, we're not able to take new registrations for that at this point. So we'll see you in uh, 13 minutes back here. <laughs>